I call this meeting of the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Economic Development to order. This is the February 5th, 2020 meeting. I am Suzanne Lonis Croft. I'm the chair of the committee and the MLA for Lunenburg. The committee will be receiving a presentation from the chair of the Forestry Transition Team, Kelly Ann Dean, Deputy Minister, and representatives of the team. Julie Towers, Deputy Minister of Lands and Forests, and Ava Zapala, Zasplay, sorry, uh, Associate Deputy Minister of Labor and Advanced Education. I practiced that before the meeting, <laughs> too. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll ask the committee members to introduce themselves, starting with Ms. Chender. Hi, welcome, Claudia Chender, MLA for Dartmouth South. Hello, good morning, Lisa Roberts, MLA for Halifax Needham. Hello, good morning, MLA, Tori Rushton, Cumberland South. Good morning, welcome, my name is Tim Houston, I'm the MLA for Pictou East. Jeff McClellan, MLA for Glace Bay, filling in for Hugh McKay. Good morning, Keith Irving, MLA for King South, and looking forward to hearing about your work. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Rushton as a member of the... Uh, Oh, sorry. <laughs> Good morning to three wonderful ladies. Well, welcome this morning. And uh, Rafa Di Costanzo, MLA for Clayton Park West. Okay, and I'd like to welcome you, Mr. Rushton, to the um, committee. And this is your first official meeting, so welcome. Um, our ledge counsel to today is Mr. Gordon Hebb. And our dear clerk, Darlene Henry, this is her last committee meeting, and we will miss you. So let's be gentle with her as she rolls out to retirement. And uh, But we really appreciate um, those of you who, who'd come to committee uh, would not know all the work um, that goes into being the clerk. And she is so on the ball uh, with her communications and preparing for the meetings and keeping me as the chair informed. And uh, we're going to really miss you. I know you'll be replaced by somebody who is just as astute as you, um, because all the committee clerks that we have are very, very good um, organizers and committee workers. So um, all the best in your retirement. And um, we, I just want to give some reminders um, for people to have their phones turned off or on vibrate. Um, we are not allowed to take any photos or recordings except for the media during the proceedings of the meeting. Washrooms and coffee are to my left. And um, if there is an emergency, we'll, we'll leave by Granville Street and meet up at the Grand Parade Square by St. Paul's Church. Um, members and witnesses, please wait to be recognized by me, the chair, uh, so that your microphone can be appropriately turned on for recording purposes. I will ask um, our witnesses to. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Mr. McGuire. Brendan McGuire, Halifax Atlantic. Good to see you. Thank you. I will ask our, our witnesses to introduce themselves and with Miss Dean. Maybe you can introduce the team you brought with you. Sure. And should I begin with my opening remarks? Or? And you can fall, fall right into your opening remarks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us today. Um, as you know, on January 3rd, Premier McNeil announced a transition team to provide advice to government on short and long-term solutions for Nova Scotia's forestry sector. The mandate of our team is to advise on short-term support for affected workers and businesses throughout the forestry sector, advise on potential areas of investment related to the $50 million mm -hmm. transition fund, and identify longer-term and innovative approaches for the forestry industry in Nova Scotia while ensuring an ecologically sustainable and global competitive forestry advantage for the province, forestry sector for the province. I'm pleased to share information today on behalf of the nine member forestry transition team. I'm joined by my colleagues, Lands and Forestry Deputy Minister Julie Towers, Labour and Advanced Education Associate Deputy Minister Ava Zapley. Simon Dantremont is a Deputy Minister of Energy and Mines. He's the fourth member from within government. In asking me to lead this team, the Premier was very clear that Nova Scotia needs a strong forestry sector, that we need to find the path forward together with people and businesses directly involved in forestry. 
I'd also like to thank the five external members who are at the table with us, the transition team. They're working countless hours listening to people from all areas of the sector and sharing their advice, which is rooted in their own experience and expertise. Those members are Jeff Bishop, Executive Director, Forest Nova Scotia, Doug Ledwidge, President and CEO of Ledwidge Lumber, Debbie Reeves, Chair of the Large Private Non-Industrial Landowners of Nova Scotia, and Greg Watson, Manager at, North, at Nova North uh, Forest Owners Co-op, as well as Don Bureau, President, Nova Scotia Community College. And many more voices are being heard. We have met or spoken with members of associations and stakeholder groups, sawmill owners, woodlot owners, contractors, as well as subject matter experts. Each of us are attending meetings and information sessions, taking calls, reviewing letters and proposals, and listening. All ideas and concerns are brought to the table to guide our discussions and advice. Taking on this work, we knew it would be a difficult and uncertain time for many people across the province, and government made a commitment to help. Our first priority as a transition team was to assist workers and businesses and find ways to keep people working. Even before the transition team met, we established a toll-free line so people could find out what help was available and where. More than 430 people have called so far. People who have been laid off with urgent needs can now access emergency assistance funding through local Access Nova Scotia centres. This is also available to self-employed workers. A confidential toll-free line is also open for anyone who needs emotional support. About 15 information sessions have been held across the province so far with our federal partners, and here people are learning about jobs that are available, how to apply for them, training opportunities, and also about employment insurance. More than 200 people attended the first six sessions in Pictou County. We have been hearing loud and clear that people want to keep working in Nova Scotia. We need skilled and talented people in the forestry sector of today and tomorrow, and in other areas of our economy. My colleague, Ava, will speak to the new $1.5 million apprenticeship initiative that helps workers fast track through training and certification free of charge so they can get back into the workforce more quickly. We want to keep people working. That's why an additional $7 million was allocated for civil culture and road programs for Crown land and private land. Contractors and woodlot owners can start applying for this funding on February 14th. Lands and Forestry is also talking to Northern Pulp on how work can continue on Crown lands licensed to the company. Contractors told us they needed help covering payments on their equipment. They can now access a repayable line of credit through their local credit union of up to $180,000 guaranteed by the province. We've allocated $5 million from the transition fund for this initiative. Finding markets for wood chips and other residuals is a priority for the sector. On Monday, government issued an RFP to convert six public buildings to wood heat using chips and other lower grade wood. While we know this is on a smaller scale, it's a start and it could provide a new market for some suppliers. Private sector operators have been looking for new opportunities and we're considering how government can best support their efforts while minimizing any international trade risk. We worked hard to earn an exclusion from U.S. duties for our lumber and we achieved that because our industry operates based on fair market principles. Government, however, can assist industry by working with the federal government and our contacts in key markets to open doors and raise concerns about trade barriers such as plant health restrictions in the EU that make it difficult to export. Our work to date has been focused on forestry sector workers and businesses in the short term. We are not done, more initiatives are in the works. And while those continue, our focus is turning to longer term opportunities. We want to work with the sector to identify new market opportunities and innovative approaches that support a globally competitive forestry sector. We need diversification and we need to increase the value of our forests. The Forest Nova Scotia AGM is coming up next week and we look forward to, again to hearing directly from people working in forestry about their ideas. I'll now give the floor to my colleagues and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ms. Zappale. <coughs> Thank you very much. I'm honoured to sit on the forestry transition team. My primary interest is how we can best respond to the needs of forestry workers today and planning for the skills and workforce needs of the future of the forestry sector. I've worked in the education and training sector for more than 33 years. 
Whether people need to access short-term support, get help finding a new job, or get introduced to new employment opportunities through retraining and certification, I'm pleased to say that the province, the Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Agency, and our partners such as Nova Scotia Works and the Nova Scotia Community College have a range of programs that can help. We have heard most people want to stay in Nova Scotia and we want to help them do that. My department works with all major sector associations and these partnerships are helping us identify labour gaps as well as job opportunities. A few weeks ago, the Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Agency and the Nova Scotia Community College launched an initiative designed in direct response to the needs of workers. Each person who comes forward from the forestry sector can have one-on-one one -on -one assessment of their individual training and work experience and work with someone to develop a customized training plan to achieve their goals. Some workers will pursue apprenticeship in a skilled trade as a career option, while others with work experience in a trade may challenge for certification. Others may want to pursue a completely different career path. All of these options are available. We have a range of programs that may be suitable for all different needs and our people are ready to help. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Towers. Thank you, everyone. Um, so this is an area I've been immersed in for pro over 35 years since graduate school at University of New Brunswick to working as a wildlife biologist looking at forest operations to being the executive director for Forest Parks and Wildlife to now as a deputy minister at Lands of Forestry. So these are people that I know since university that I've worked with in the field. Um, so it's very much something that I deal with every day and I'm glad to be here to help provide information. This is an incredibly important sector in this province. So I know it's a difficult time. Um, it's the nature of the industry um, often, and um, we're looking to find ways to help people through that. Um, we've certainly been on a path of change, really, in forestry, not just in Nova Scotia, but across Canada for many years. Um, and many of you are aware of the work we've been doing through Professor Leahy's report on forest practices. Um, moving towards ecological forestry, I'm sure you'll have some questions around that. Um, one of the other areas that I've been working on is not only on the forest practices, but um, also about um, the products and the processes that we have in forestry and what are the opportunities. And we started some of this work after some of the upheaval in 2011 and 2012, and I'm the chair of the Innovation Hub. So we're looking for op future opportunities as well. There's a lot of projects. Um, I'd be happy to speak to any of those today as well. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, we will do rounds of questioning. Um, we will start with the PC caucus. Who's starting? Mr. Houston. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning. Uh, appreciate you appearing here before. I would have to say that I was uh, a little surprised when the um, transition team was first announced. Um, with all respect, I thought maybe the deputy of business or, or lands and forest might have been leading the transition team. But I... I um, I want to go back to an interview because um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the initial Plan B and the initial Plan B team that the Premier had referred to at previous times in the past. In an interview with uh, CBC on, on February 22nd, and I'll table a, a transcript of it, the Premier was asked about the very situation that we find ourselves in today. It was about with respect to a plan B. And I want to read the Premier's comments from that. Uh, the Premier said on February 22nd, we currently have a committee internally right now looking at all of the possible options if the mill closes. What do we do with sawmills in terms of excess chips and residual matter that has now become part of the business model? What are potential retraining programs that are available? Will we then, uh, we will then in very short order be going external out to our partners in the sawmill industry, looking at other partners in the labour industry to see the art of the possible for providing options in that community. We are gathering that information right now. We will continue making sure we have that information internally and we'll go out to our partners in the community in the not too distant future. And that was a year ago as we know. Um, so back in February last year, there was a team of deputy ministers and staff from the Premier's office working towards uh, a transition, uh, working towards a plan B. We don't know the makeup of that team. Um, on, on March 
uh, 13th, 2019, the Minister of Business in, in, the, in the legislature listed off a number of, of members of, the, of that team that was working at that time, a bunch of deputy ministers. Uh, he referred to a task, a task force of the best people that, that we have, that the government has, and the best decision makers. Um, he didn't list you on that list, so I don't know if you were part of the Plan B team at that time. Um, but assuming that this Plan B team was acting as the as the Premier indicated and as the Minister had indicated in the Legislature, I wonder if you can um, provide to this committee a detailed assessment of what that committee did and the information that they have shared with you. Um, if you can provide that or indicate whether you were starting from scratch on, on January 3rd, that'd be helpful. Okay. And can you table that document, please? Sure. Uh, Ms. Dean. Um, Thank you, Mr. Houston. Um, I'm sure it wouldn't come to as a surprise to anybody around this table that as deputies, we collaborate on a regular basis and we come together often on issues that are before us or issues that we're anticipating. And of course, Northern Pulp would have been one of those issues um, that people would have been working on and um, looking for solutions and opportunities. So of course, we share information um, and we discuss how we would move forward. Um, the information and the ideas that had been uh, discussed, um, I have had access to my colleagues to have further discussions. And uh, the rationale for, for my leadership on this committee has much to do with the fact that we're looking forward, not behind. We're looking ahead to see where opportunities might be where export opportunities are, how we can support the forestry sector in looking to diversify, to uh, look for new markets, and to find new opportunities, and not um, jeopardize the U.S. Uh, softwood lumber exclusion that we worked so hard to achieve. So the trade lens is an important part of all of the work that we're going to be doing moving forward. So. Um, all of the colleagues that I have access to have expertise in this area, and we are bringing it to the table as we look at possibilities going forward. Thank you. Mr. Houston for supplementary. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, I, I was curious as to whether your committee was starting from scratch, um, because I was trying to reconcile the, the Premier's various statements on this one that have they've basically been at odds. And in February, he was on CBC saying he had a committee working on this. Um, he wrote to me on, on January 22nd in response to a letter that I wrote him. And in his response on January 22nd, he encouraged me to stop writing and stop asking questions. Um, and in that letter, he said, he said very specifically, he said that he appreciates, I appreciate your concern and interest, uh, but a letter campaign in these early days of the transition team's work is not helpful. It was at best premature to expect detailed answers from the team when members of the forestry sector had not had their first meeting yet. So I was trying to reconcile the Premier a year ago saying, we got this. We have a committee of people, the brightest minds in business working on, in the in government work on this. And then a year later saying, hey, give us some time. We're starting from scratch. So I couldn't reconcile uh, which, which one of those statements was most truthful. Um, so what I'm hearing from you is that your committee was indeed starting from scratch, uh, but I just want to make sure that I'm not that I'm hearing you correctly. Um, and I'll ask very specifically: the committee that the premier indicated started a year ago of of, of deputies and 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 people within government. That committee, which the premier's comments on CBC would could be taken to mean people were actually working on this, trying to come up with ideas and solutions. Did that committee produce anything by way of minutes or anything in the way of, of written ideas or anything that you can share with us? Or was that committee that really, really didn't produce anything? And the Premier's most recent statement of, of, of last week was more accurate in that you were starting from scratch. Is it starting from scratch or was it a year's worth of work by the brightest minds in the government? Ms. Dean. <clears throat> um, 
Again, I would say that uh, the committee um, had information and we have expertise around the table that had worked previously and identified opportunities and had done assessment and analysis. And again, I would say that, that we work no differently on this than we have on some other issues that come up that we all work collaboratively on. Um, with respect to specific questions, um, you'll have to address those to the, the Premier. Uh, what I can say is that you have also written directly to me to ask for clarification on certain items, and I've provided those responses back to you. And um, some of your questioning around the very specific aspects of the fund, that is information, of course, that we would not have had in any previous deliberations or discussions around, um, you know, Northern Pulp. So details around how how the fund would be allocated and what uh, it would be used for would have been um, information that we would not have uh, had details on because we hadn't started to have those conversations yet. So, um, that's good. Okay, uh, we'll turn it over to the NDP caucus, Ms. Roberts. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to. Uh, I think direct my questions more so to Ms. Towers. Um, one of one of the questions that I'm hearing um, from various uh, contacts in the forestry sector around the province um, is is about the land that Northern Pulp actually owns or manages, and and you know some of that land was purchased um, uh, in not too recent times. Um, or not, not too distant times, sorry, uh, with support from the, the taxpayers of Nova Scotia um, as, as, as part of support at, a, at, another, at another point in time, uh, 475,000 uh, acres. Um, so I think people are interested in that land both because they want to, they're, they're concerned about how that land will be managed going into the future, given that we are at this point of transition in the forestry sector where we've committed to more ecological forestry, and that's a lot of land that has been managed uh, primarily for, for pulp, which, you know, has not necessarily been in line with, with Leahy's recommendations. Um, but also, uh, I think there's, you know, that, that land represents kind of the landscape on which the forestry sector can continue to work, but if it's been managed for Northern Pulp and now Northern Pulp is not operating and, and uh, kind of coordinating uh, harvests on that land, will other players uh, in Nova Scotia that are looking for those new markets, those new opportunities have, have access and, and who's, who's basically managing it? Um, so I, I would appreciate whatever light you can shed on that situation. Ms. Towers? Okay, there's, a, there's quite a lot of tangle and I'll see if I can get them right because there is a, often a lot of, um, uh, I would say sometimes just that uh, information isn't always out there for people to understand the difference in terms of where wood comes from and who manages it. So it's very much to your question. So um, I'll, I'll chunk it up. So many people know in the province we have five and a half million hectares. Roughly half is, is what we call small private, so less than 20,000 hectares, right? Um, and then we have uh, larger private, um, and there's almost like two categories of private <laughs> that we deal with, and we'll talk about that in the programs. There's the industrial private, sometimes called freehold, that companies, typically forestry companies, owned. So you'll hear that terminology. So when we speak about uh, northern pulp or northern timber, which is the company that, that owns the land, um, some of you may remember, particularly those from Pictou County, of the different owners of the mill in Pictou that owned it at different times as it went through Nina and Blue Wolf and northern timber with paper company, paper excellence. And they split it roughly in half, about uh, 500,000 acres, roughly. Um, and so there's... That land that's held by Northern Timber, half went to Wagner, who has since sold off a number of chunks to various owners. And <laughs> I'm not trying to make this complicated, but it, it, it's interesting. If you don't understand the ownership, you don't understand the wood flow because it comes from those different sources. So the loan that you're talking about, the $75 million um, for those, that 475,000 acres, um, is 
um, backstopped so that if any time that loan wasn't paid, that land reverts back to the province. So the security is there. Um, so Northern Pulp as a company managed to move wood from small private, from their freehold, and, and this is the really important part, to, um, there's a Scott Maritimes Limited Act, okay, that's been in place since the 60s. And under that act, it's not land, it's volume, okay? And so under the act, they have access to 100,000 tons of fiber, okay? So traditionally, that's been roughly 85% softwood, 15% hardwood. Now, of the wood, you, coming from all those sources, if you come when it gets cut, um, there's different parts of the tree. And so always goes to the best value. It, it's the nature of business. They're always going to, where's the best profit? So if it's large enough and the right quality, it's going to go to sawmills and become saw logs or stud wood, right? Construction, two by fours, et cetera. Then the other parts that get shaved off, the bark can go various ways. It may get burnt for energy, sometimes right at a mill site. It's part of their own energy source. There can be shavings that could go to farmers. It can go for stuffing pet beds, it, all kinds of residual uses there. And then roughly a third of it is pulpwood. And that's the product that would go to a pulp and paper mill, the former Bowater Mersey, Northern Pulp, or Port Hawkesbury paper, and minus uh, basin pulp and paper when it was in place. So, so you've got different pieces going different places. So um, it's a long way around, you gotta understand, to come back to in terms of who has access. They're, the provincial crown lands on, in the central region on which Northern Pulp operated and its predecessors for volume is still provincial crown land. They still have rights under that act to access volume, even if they're not operating the mill, okay? So what we're in discussions with them is about ways to manage that volume to still flow it within the system. So sawmills are still getting it. A hardboard mill is still getting it, okay? Because remember, all these companies exchange. It's a constant exchange of those different products that they do fiber exchanges. So that will continue, but it will absolutely be under all the practices that we require on Crown land. So that was a long-winded way, hopefully, to answer your question. So, Ms. Roberts. So I, I appreciate that, and I also do appreciate how complex it is and how like incredibly interlocked at many different points um, these different players in the forestry sector are. Um, that said, it, um, a, I'm, I'm interested if you can shed any light on like what are the options that you're looking at for that, that management, like who is going to send, okay, this block, we're going to like apply for a cut. Um, you know, who is going to pay the contractor if effectively the mill is shut down, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't need its 30%. I, I don't understand what the incentive would be for the mill to be playing that managerial role of, you know, figuring out, you know, what, what needs to go into that very complicated kind of system where, where wood gets processed and sorted. So what are the options that you're considering? Ms. Towers? There it goes. Okay, so, it, so there's a range of choices. Remember, Northern Pulp may not be operating the pulp mill and producing pulp, but it still exists as a company. It still has qualified people in their woodland section who are planners, foresters, forest technicians, GIS, etc. There are already sites out there that have been approved for harvesting that can be reassigned. So the same contractors that might have worked for Northern Pulp can do the wood directly for an Elmsdale lumber or a Ledwidge lumber. So um, most contractors and their crews aren't employees of Northern Pulp, remember. So they can work. It doesn't matter which mill is going to use the product. Um, so it can be either um, managed through Northern Pulp or directly through another Crown licensee, either the existing ones, which include Taylor Lumber and Great Northern Timber, but any of the other companies can also be crown licensees and assigned a license under ministerial authority. Um, and so it can be managed through Northern but directed to sawmills or other mills. Or it can be directly assigned to another company. Okay? 
but it would be the same contractors and crews. It's kind of who's, whether they're contracted or subcontracted, it would still be employing them. And that's the key part that we look for. Okay, thank you. We'll move it over to the Liberal Caucus. Mr. McClellan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks uh, everyone for being here today. Obviously an important uh, conversation for, for the province uh, in many regards. So uh, anytime we can uh, share information and disseminate the, the facts, it's, it's good. So thanks for being here and for your continued work on the transition team. Uh, just um, since uh, Mr. Houston referenced me, I just want to get, a, I guess, provide a little clarification. I'm not sure, um, and I don't know if you have to table things here, but exactly what the list I provided. Um, at that point, there wouldn't have been a transition team. I don't know if it was a list of deputies that I deal with, or I'm not sure how that sort of is applicable. And again, I've got a, a terrible memory, so I, I could have said uh, something to that effect around deputies overall, but I can tell you that uh, if I was making a list and, and identifying uh, competent deputy ministers, uh, Kelly and Dean would be at the top of my list. So I know that for the record, um, if, we, if we were uh, identifying people who could be part of this, uh, Deputy Minister Dean would be uh, someone who I would lean on and have leaned on and have a, a long relationship with uh, in my 10 years as opposition and certainly as government uh, and for um, our other two deputies as well. Um, have, having the opportunity to see what you do on a daily basis, uh, not only around the transition and uh, respectively in lands and forests uh, and at LAE, uh, it's, it's critical work and it's exemplary service. So I certainly, again, uh, not that anyone's diminishing your role, but I just want to say that uh, uh, it's critical and this isn't light and fluffy stuff. This is heavy hitting uh, topic and, and content that you're dealing with and, and I think you're doing great work and um, you know, with respect, uh, whether or not the Deputy Minister of Business is at the table, uh, I feel that I'm very well represented as Nova Scotian and, and uh, uh, from a government perspective and as an MLA. So um, I'm uh, very happy with the, the work you're doing and, and continue to do that. Um, with respect to um, probably uh, Deputy Minister Towers, this one's for you. Um, you referenced the, the, a lot of the stuff and I'll be the first one to admit I don't understand a lot of the details you just shared uh, for, for, uh, for Lisa, but um, with respect to the Leahy report, the ecological forestry, those things, can you sort of bridge the gap to, um, as it relates to the industry, new markets? So when you're looking at what's there in existing um, practices and what's recommended, how do we make that jump to finding those new unexplored? I mean, obviously, we've got a, a, a significant uh, wooden, wood products footprint from a trade perspective and, and for new markets. But how do we identify the, the work that's been done in, in understanding what we have to do to move forward with finding new, new customers for that product? Ms. Towers. Maybe I'll start and in, in, uh, Deputy Dean can add as well on some of the markets because it's a, it's a global marketplace that forestry deals within. It's a global industry. Um, I can speak to, because it's products and it's processes. So we have and have had many different um, products that have been uh, produced in Nova Scotia for many years and will continue to be. Um, but there's also new ones that are evolving, and um, ecologic forestry ties into that very much because it's about having the diversity in your forest of species and sizes and um, the what kinds of products can come from them. It just gives you more choices, okay? So, so many people know the, the sort of typical products that have been produced for many years. So pulp, paper, lumber, um, there's uh, hardboard, many know the uh, um, Louisiana, Louisiana Pacific Mill down in the Chester area, um, for example, that does things like the, the skins that go on doors, you know, stuff like that, and they use hardwood. So we use both hardwood and softwood. Um, there's, but what we're starting to see, besides those traditional products that will continue, um, is we're getting things, and many of you would have seen them or used them in your own home. Wood pellets is a huge area. Um, the fiber bricks that people, because people don't like messy fireplaces, they're great products, and Lewis Molding is, is really ramping up the number of those. It's a huge market. Um, one of the things that's very much evolving is how you produce energy, and because wood is a renewable resource, the demand is huge globally. Um, and so that's only going to keep going up. 
The other ones that are really starting to come out, and that's uh, what we're doing a lot of work through the Innovation Hub and our partners, that's when you're starting to get into biofuels, such as biodiesel, that can be used in automobiles, marine environment, industrial uses. Um, remember, uh, energy could be uh, things such as electricity, but it can be heat. It can be other. There's byproducts that come off. Um, they're really getting to the point that they can take products that traditionally use a petroleum-based product and use something that comes from plant fiber, whether it's agriculture or forestry, because you're breaking it down to the carbon level um, so that over time, most of our products, you'll see that. Um, we're looking at things like how you can use plant fiber that comes from wood um, uh, into things such as food, both for uh, livestock, for aquaculture feed. Um, there's uh, some of the human uh, uh, supplements you can use that fiber in. Um, you can replace petroleum products like uh, in tires. So there's a, there's a huge range. Um, some of it is at the level of what can be used in paints or cosmetics. So it's, it's rapidly evolving, and it's a really exciting area that we're looking at. So hopefully that helps. Did you want to add anything, Deputy Dean? No, thanks. Okay, thank you. Supplementary, Mr. McClellan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thanks for that, uh, Deputy Minister. That's, uh, uh, I think, helpful to understand because, again, uh, those uh, many folks who are, um, you know, fo focused on and transfixed on how we get to to the new sort of um, reality around forestry and those new markets, I think, have to understand uh, what it is, what kind of context we're talking in terms of those new options and products and, and the like. Um, the, my next topic, I think, uh, probably, uh, Deputy Minister Dean, would be. Um, uh, good to, to uh, address this one, but maybe uh, all three of you want to uh, jump in. It's around the, the complexities of, of uh, trade compliance, and I think that in all sort of the literature that you see and, and the stories around any any support that the transition team, uh, so this is specific to the transition team, could give to the sector, um, there's always the lens of, of trade compliance. And I know that um, one of the things my first touch point with uh, the, the, the forestry sector uh, was around the softwood lumber dispute and the fact that um, we have the we have the exclusion um, largely and we're one of few provinces that do and it's largely through the work of the sector so it wasn't government it wasn't politics and back and forth and meetings in Washington this was the, the practices that our forestry sector decided to follow that got us that exclusion and, and I've heard it from uh, the, their own uh, lips down in Washington that um, we're the gold standard in terms of, of fair trade and free trade around uh, f the forestry sector and obviously sp specific to software lumber we can't jeopardize that uh, and any other thing that we do in terms of any of the support. So, you know, all the assets, aspects of the transition team that you're looking at for supports have to fit in um, the trade compliance. We cannot break these rules. So um, what, when you're having these discussions, so with Jeff Bishop, for example, and, and those who are at the table, um, what's the sort of the approach, the methodology to ensure? Does that run back through IGA, or is it sort of, obviously Jeff and, and his people would have a very good understanding of the trade compliance too, so what's, what, what are the lenses and the, and the focal points around trade compliance that we can ensure that we're, before we ever uh, advance a, a, a support program for the sector, that it's 100% trade compliance? Ms. Dean. Thank you. So, you know, ensuring that we, uh, protect the uh, exclusion that we have for the softwood lumber agreement is critical in everything that we do and is something that the saw mill owners feel is also very, very important because, you know, the consequences of, of not doing that mean that in the future we could be subject to countervailing duties that already margins are very slim uh, in the sector, so that would make uh, export um, practically, um, it wouldn't be economically feasible for them. So, you know, you're absolutely right. The fact that we have a softwood lumber exclusion uh, was the result of a lot of hard work uh, with the sector, um, as well as uh, the fact that we have a market-based dumpage system. It really comes back to that. And so as we go forward, we have to ensure that any support that we provide, and we know that you know there are opportunities to help people, workers in the sector, but any support that we provide has to be viewed through a trade lens to avoid a future challenge and future risk to that exclusion. And what I mean by that is you can't provide a direct subsidy to business or to a sawmill or to somebody that is directly connected. And if we do that, then that raises risk. 
Um, so as we look at the kind of support we can provide, we're trying to help workers, we're trying to support training, we're pro providing uh, support to contractors. So these are things that, as we view through a trade lens, would not be considered direct subsidy to the sector to, to sawmills. And so we're consulting regularly with um, the lawyers that had worked with us on the softwood lumber exclusion to make sure that some of these programs and some of the support that we do provide um, would not be viewed as enhancing our trade risk. Okay. I uh, will turn it over to PC Caucus. Mr. Houston. Thank you. Um, it's, it's, as we're hearing, this is, this is a complicated, this is a big task. Um, and this is, this is the exact reason that a year ago we were, as an opposition party, encouraging the government to, to get to work uh, on thinking of what's possible. And we, we did take, um, we, we took the, the, the Premier and, and comments that we heard in the legislature at face value, that there was work being done. And I think what we're finding out now and have found out over the last few weeks is is not a lot if any work was re was really done and I, I do I do think that's that's important because we have to learn from um, mistakes we have to learn from mistakes and go forward so I, I know that um, I heard um, uh, Deputy Dean say that the plan is to keep people working and and already that plan is is failing People are losing their jobs already right now, so we, we want to make sure that that there is a plan so um, a transition a transition team for the forestry sector. Had it have been established a, a year ago, there might have been a, a smoother transition. Might have been able to work with people at Northern Pulp or people in the industry and say, this is what uh, may happen and this is how we can transition. But we, we haven't seen a transition plan. We're seeing a kind of a, a pick up the pieces plan is what we're, what we're seeing and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big task uh, before you. So, um, what what my what my my question is is we we have a, a situation where we possibly had two committees maybe the committee before existed maybe it didn't exist um, um, as I say I haven't seen evidence of its existence other than the premier's comments that it existed but we know we have industry that have a lot of questions and very few answers about about where this is all going to go and we know that we have a government that was very unprepared uh, for for something that was always a possibility. And that, that is adding a lot of anxiety and stress to, to a lot of different families. So I do want to I do want to I do want to make one more attempt to kind of clarify what has happened for the past year. And um, I'd be very interested to know if the previous transition team had terms of reference. Um, and if you've seen those terms of reference, and are they the same as the terms of reference uh, as, as your committee? Ms. D. Thank you, Mr. Houston. Um, you know, I think what I would say is that at this point, uh, I have said that we've shared information, that we work collaboratively, and I think that the proof is actually in the actions that we've taken since we have been formed. Um, there's been a significant amount of work that's, that has uh, gone on in order to move the sector forward. And a lot of the, um, the work that we're doing, um, this, sec this is a sector, as, as my colleague Julie said, this is a sector that's been in transition for a period of time. Um, it's a sector that actually had a major customer and and was able to sell to a major customer for a period of time. So um, now that the business doesn't have one major customer, it has to make a change. And so any business that's focused on one customer has to think about diversification because it creates risk. So, you know, in moving forward, um, there are companies within the sector that would have been thinking about the possibility. We, as, as uh, government employees and colleagues, have been thinking about the possibility. Mm -hmm. So now some of the things that you're seeing in place are based on our understanding of impacts and how um, not having northern pulp would filter throughout the uh, sector and uh, affect the integrated supply and the integrated nature of those relationships. So in terms of keeping people working, um, there are people who are in the sector and they are still working and there are, uh, I've been impressed actually by businesses' resilience and their ability to find alternate markets and to do um, things um, that continue to keep their employees working. 
you know, there are some who are having a difficult time, and we are hearing through the 1-800 line and uh, through our other accesses that um, people are looking for work. And I'm going to let Ava speak a little bit to, uh, to this work because the outreach sessions that uh, we have done and the people that we've talked to and the people that have come forward, um, some of them, they do want to stay in Nova Scotia and they want to work and they're looking at other opportunities if they don't want to stay in the forestry sector. So, you know, that's a priority area of, of ours is to make sure that those who want to find work can find that and we can connect them to other opportunities. So, Ava, maybe you can speak Ms. to that. Zappale. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Dean. So my interest is in uh, Nova Scotians and, and helping Nova Scotians stay in Nova Scotia, working in Nova Scotia communities. And uh, uh, what I've seen in labor and advanced education over the years is so often we have the workers and we have the jobs, but the two don't always match in terms of skill sets. And so, for example, my team put together a list of the capital projects coming up in 2020. There's 204 capital projects, private and public, in Nova Scotia. Huge demand for laborers, carpenter and tradespeople. Do we have the match there? So, so if people say there aren't jobs in Nova Scotia, that's not quite correct. And, and there's jobs in rural Nova Scotia as well. Um, throughout the province. It's matching the people to the jobs and ensuring they have the skill set to do a new job. So um, we've had, we, we met with Northern Pulp employees, um, over 200, 225 employees at, on January 6th. At that session, the employees, many of them came forward and said, look, I'm a power engineer, but I, I feel I could, uh, with a small bit of upgrading, I could be a, a plumber or I could uh, be an electrician. Um, one guy had been driving a, a boom truck and he said, I, I'd like to work on a, something else, down in the port or something. So people came forward and said, I have these skills, but I don't know how to translate them into a new opportunity. And, and so that's what uh, made us think that we should offer a customized approach through the Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Agency and the Nova Scotia Community College that takes a person from where they're at right now uh, with their current skill set to a new job and a new opportunity by, by accelerating that, that um, process for them. So, so we have uh, 52 Nova Scotia works offices throughout Nova Scotia, many small communities throughout the province. People, the best thing um, workers can do is go to their Nova Scotia works office and register, and that gets them into the system. And people are there to help them with every step of their journey from the point where they identify that they, they want to retrain to getting the retraining. Okay. Mr. Houston for a supplementary. Thank you, and uh, thank you for that information. It is important. Some percentage of the people may may transition to a new career, but I mean, I guess I guess when I heard the, the the comment that the plan was to keep people working, I guess I assumed that that was to keep people working in the forestry industry, which I didn't realize that a main main function of the transition team is to transition people out of the forestry industry. And right now, I still want to focus on on the transition for the for the forestry industry. I think that I think that's uh, what what's important. And I, and I will go back one more time to the to the premier's comments a year ago on February twenty second, twenty nineteen, and the premier and the premier was very clear. Uh, we currently have a committee internally right now looking at all possible options if the mill closes. And I, my focus is on the next thing. What and the premier was question was. What do we do with the sawmills in terms of excess chips and residual matter that has now become part of the business model? This is a, this is a question the, the the premier posed a year ago and indicated that he had uh, a committee, internal committee, working on that question. And I guess my my question for you is: Can you provide anything to this committee? Uh, in terms of minutes of what was discussed, of where that's going, or is it actually the case that that didn't go anywhere uh, for an entire year, and it's just starting right now with, with trying to trying to figure that out? Because I believe uh, that if the work would have started in earnest uh, in earnest a year ago, we'd be further along with the transition plan than starting from scratch after the fact. And I think that's uh, it obviously puts your committee in a difficult position. Um, but I just want maybe we can just maybe we can just kind of close the loop on this one. Did you get anything from that committee in terms of writing that you're willing to share with Nova Scotians? Ms. Dean, 
I have Julie Towers on the committee who was on a previous committee. Um, and Julie, you can share information. Uh, Look, Mr. Houston, again, you know, to think that we as deputy ministers wouldn't share information or discuss work that had happened in the past or ideas that people had come up with or shared or discussed, um, you know, of course we do, because that is as a starting point. And, uh, you know, we aren't starting from scratch here. We have people experienced in the sector who are talking to us. We, uh, you know, we know, uh, and I can I can turn it over to Julie to, to add some value, uh, add some comments as well. We we understand, you know, the the, uh, the impact that this decision has and the need to address um, you know, the the challenges that are ensuing in the sector. So, of course, drawing on resources throughout government is how we, we, uh, we design and move forward. So, you know, we're not starting from scratch. And, uh, you know, and I would say again that the actions that we have taken, the the programming that has come forward to date is all based on an understanding of the sector, how it works, what the needs are, and uh, and how it reacts under pressure, so or under or under stress, which of course we're seeing with the loss of a major customer in the uh, in the chain. Um, so I think I would leave it there. Hey, thank you. Um, turning it over to the NDP caucus, Ms. Chender. Hi. Um, so the current situation obviously harkens back to previous closures. So one of the things that, that we've been looking at a fair amount is the closure of the Bowater Mersey uh, mill, which of course happened under the NDP government. Um, and what we saw there was a community-based transition team, um, which is quite different than this forestry transition team. Um, and based on the conversations we've had with folks that were involved at the time, you know, the idea of that was really bringing in representation from the impacted communities, like looking at those specific areas that were impacted um, and allowing the people involved to act as advocates for their own community. <laughs> the reality with the current transition team is that it's mostly deputies, and obviously you guys have a lot of expertise, but also because you all report to the premier, we like end up in a version of question period when we talk about it. It's he said, he said, <laughs> I'm all, even though you're all, you're all women. Um, <laughs> but but you know, we, we get, you know, this is where we end up when we're trying to talk about things. And so this is why we see so much value um, when we come to these kind of major crossroads and transitions in a community-based approach, and ideally an independent community-based approach. And so I guess my question is, um, and, and I wanna just clarify, I'm not saying that any of you are political operatives, I'm just saying that by nature of the reporting structure, right? So, so I guess what I'm saying is, has there been a, is the transition team actually actively meeting with um, community members? Do you have really strong representation? Will you bring some of them on to that transition team so that it can look and feel more like um, a solution um, that's at least partially arrived at by the folks facing the challenges? Um, and have you considered an independent chair? So whoever wants to take that question. Ms. Dean. Thank you. So thank you for that. And, you know, I assure you that we are hearing voices from the community and, you know, we do have representation from outside uh, of government, as you know, so um, Don Bureau is bringing, you know, a, a really strong voice around training needs and adaptation and how we may move forward in the future. We have Greg Watson, who is in the business. He works uh, and he is very involved in the community and bringing information to us on a regular basis around what he's hearing. He's going to community meetings. He was at the, um, the Cumberland uh, transition team meeting because that community has come together uh, on their own to look for proactive ways and ideas and they have they have provided that to us and interestingly some of the ideas they have are things that we actually acted on so the idea to provide uh, relief to contractors that was one example of something that came from that group um, you know the uh, so 
just as an example. So, uh, we have met with um, industry representation as well. So Jeff Bishop, who is the uh, executive director for Forest Nova Scotia, he's on the team. He brings a variety of perspectives from his membership, who we actually went and met with in very early days immediately. Um, we uh, have Debbie Reeves, who is a, um, as I said, um, involved in as a representative of woodlot owners, and she has a wealth of experience and contacts in that sector. She's a new Ross. Um, you know, Greg is in Tatamagush, and then we um, also have Doug Ledwich, who is bringing a wealth of experience in the in the business and also the sawmill expertise. So they are hearing from their colleagues from the sector they are bringing that information to us in addition we've received calls people have reached out to us we've met with people individually um, and we are open to receiving ideas and feedback and a lot of it has come to the transition table we've discussed it and decided which things we can actually work with and move on so um, and then Ava has been in community um, you know, with people listening to them, providing advice and, and support from a um, training and uh, uh, support perspective, but also hearing ideas. So, you know, we definitely are hearing from people. And we are making an effort to go to the AGM as well. And uh, also, wherever we can go into community, we will. I appreciate the concern that, you know, perhaps there aren't enough voices on the transition team. Um, and where we can, we will bring people in to meet with us, uh, to provide expertise that we don't have in areas that we may be looking to learn more about. Um, but, you know, everything we do has to be co-created with the sector. And I think that at times that might seem uncomfortable that we're not immediately uh, following a plan that is prescriptive. You know, we have input, we have ideas, and we're trying to determine which ones will have the greatest impact, again, while respecting our softwood lumber exclusion and our trade air, um, uh, uh, trade risk. So, Julie, I'm not sure if you want to or talk, or Ava. The, RINs, the Chamber of Commerce, the Federation of Municipalities. That's right. So, again, we heard from the Chamber of Commerce. We heard from the Federation of Municipalities, who Julie and I are going to meet with this week. Friday. Friday. Um, so, although those people may not all be sitting here, we are acutely aware of their concerns and eager to hear what they have to say and any input that they want to provide. So... Did you want to add anything, Ava? Good. You good? Ms. Yeah. Ms. Tao, did you want any? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Towers. Okay, I'll give you a simple example. Uh, the toll-free line alone, we've had 430, over 430 calls. Our staff at the department have, or staff through labor and advanced education, have spoken to all those folks. Some of them are repeat callers. So absolutely, uh, Kellyanne mentioned a lot of the ways we've been interacting. Um, and remember, this is what we do. Like, we're departments that are distributed regionally in local offices, our local staff. They know these folks. They talk to them all the time. I couldn't even tell you how many conversations I've had. Um, so that's that's very much. And, and to your point about the bow water and, and, and some of the opportunities, I see there's even more opportunity, and that's certainly what happened in Queens and Lunenburg and, um, after bow water, was talking about where they were going as communities broadly, not just in forestry, over the long term. And, and we've certainly had the immediate short-term focus, but moving into the medium and long-term focus. And that's yeah. where I think communities absolutely are, are part of that. So we'll build on it. Yes. Okay. I was going to say, I probably sent many of those to your hotline. <laughs> anyway, um, Ms. Chender for a supplementary. I appreciate that answer. Um, and I have no doubt that you guys are engaging as you can. Um, but with respect, I mean, the other folks on the f on the team are industry. So we have industry and government. We don't, as far as I can tell, have someone who has a community hat on, on that team. And feedback is great, but it's different than decision making. So I sit on the Law Amendments Committee. We get a lot of feedback. It almost never translates into a different decision, right? And so the point that I'm trying to make is who's in charge of the decisions? And I think um, 
you know, again, not impugning any of the work that you guys are doing, uh, but I think it's, it's um, you can only have a better outcome because as Ms. Towers said, you know, those questions about where those communities want to be in 10, 20, 50, 100 years are, I mean, I, I think that this is an opportunity for those conversations to happen and hopefully to happen in a really um, innovative and creative way. And I know obviously the MLAs for the area have been, you know, talking about this and talking with their constituents. But so, so it just seems like it would be such a shame if that opportunity were, were missed. Um, so uh, I guess, so I guess w with that in mind, um, you know, what are, uh, what, how do we measure the results of this transition team? So is it measured by the industry? Is it measured by outputs? Is it measured by employment numbers? Um, is there going to be a report that comes out in a year or two that talks about the work of the committee and, and whether or not it, it did what it set out to do? Ms. Dean? Um, thank you for that. And, you know, I think there are a number of ways that we can measure results. I think primarily it will be, you know, if we can ensure that we have, you know, a strong, sustainable forestry sector in the future. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with how the Leahy Report's going to be implemented, the ability for us to find new markets to add value to the products that we have um, and to ensure that people are working in the sector and that it continues to employ people. So I know that's not actual numbers and a hard core, you know, result, but that is the ultimate goal of the work that we're doing. And so, you know, as you move forward, you can look at that in terms of diversification of export markets, exports, what we're doing. Um, but I appreciate the community side of, of what you're saying because I know that as an example, the regional enterprise networks, the RENs, they really want to become involved in working with communities and finding what other opportunities there may be in driving entrepreneurship and looking for other ways for communities themselves to diversify so that you know they may not be always as dependent on the forestry sector. They may look for other opportunities as well. So a lot of that comes from the community itself. You know, and um, certain communities have already come together to look at what those opportunities might look like. So, you know, I, I think, you know, and Julie, you can add to this in terms of um, the forestry goals and objectives, but, you know, if we can say that we still have a strong sector for forestry in this province and we are adding value to our forests, keeping them healthy, but also creating export value and keep people working in the sector so that it is a strong sector. I think that that's the goal that we're aiming for. And in the process, keeping as many people employed as we can. And, you know, whether they are employed in the forestry sector or whether they choose to transition to something else. Thank you. Um, Mr. Irving for the Liberal Caucus. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here. I, I, I do think it's important for Nova Scotians, uh, just based on some of the comments from across the table, that, that uh, Nova Scotians understand that uh, our deputy ministers are politically agnostic. You serve the people of Nova Scotia. Uh, my wife is the deputy minister. I, I, she serves everyone, or she served everyone. Um, just uh, one comment to preface uh, my two questions here. Uh, my uh, conversations with uh, constituents of mine that work in the industry, I, I've been struck by their uh, willingness to look forward and not backward. Um, they they uh, accepted the decision of Northern Pulp uh, on balance and uh, we're focused on, uh, on on the future here and uh, you know I, I i don't think that they're uh, concerned about you know what the minutes were from a committee a year ago they're they're focused on going forward um and uh, you know unfortunately we're here as mlas and and i've i've uh, quickly learned at the provincial level in in uh, party politics uh, 
we have a propensity to be political. And I think uh, what I was hearing from my constituents was this was not a political issue. This, this is a, uh, a very, very important issue in which they need all Nova Scotians to be pulling together to help with this transition. Um, so I'm going to ask, I, I think everyone at this table wants to contribute and help. Uh, to find solutions here, to do what we can as MLAs in our roles as, as community leaders, in our roles of the eyes and ears on the ground. Um, what can we do as MLAs that will actually help your work? Ms. Dean? Thank you very much for the question. Um, well, you know, I think continuing to provide us with feedback you know, you're hearing from people on the ground, you're hearing what their major concerns are, so it's helpful for us to hear that, and we we welcome that feedback. I think the other thing that might be helpful, and I actually have something here that, that I will share with everybody and make sure that all MLAs receive a copy of this, um, but it's an update on the work of the, tra of the transition team, and areas of support that are available because I know that you often get lots and lots of questions in your offices and so hopefully something like this would be helpful for you to respond to some of the questions that you might receive from people looking for help, looking for assistance, wondering what might be available, wondering where to go. So um, everything that's been done to date is summarized here. And also, there is a website that people can access that is updated on a regular basis that has information on it with respect to programs and uh, areas of support for them. So you know, ensuring that that information is shared would be very helpful to the transition team's efforts because you know, this is very much a two-way process. This isn't, uh, you know, we want to hear, we need to hear, and um, we like to think that we're being responsive to, to the greatest needs that we are hearing about as we move forward. Um, but I would also agree with you that a lot of what we are hearing from people is related to how we move forward. It's related to, okay, where do we look for new opportunities? Where are the new markets? How do we find those markets? And how do we position ourselves to take advantage of these opportunities going forward? And um, that is very much the work that this team has been set up to do. So um, continuing to share that information with us from your constituents and share this would be very helpful. Mr. Irving, for your supplementary. You can you table that I um, can piece? absolutely do that. Uh, my other question um, goes to, I guess, the feelings that the people in the sector are feeling. Um, the stress on families, the lack of clarity. You know, these are people dedicated uh, to their work in the forest. Uh, Minister Towers talks about her 33 years working um, these are sometimes intergenerational businesses. These, these are business people that have put everything on the line, taken out big loans, um, and not only to feed their family, but to contribute to the Nova Scotian rural economy. Um, but they, uh, you know, I, I think we all have to be very sensitive to the, the, those uh, very personal stories and, and even just the the mental health of people, and it, it was just, it popped into my head just moments ago, Holly Carr just did an exhibit uh, at uh, the Museum of Natural History uh, that she is is uh, putting on a show in, in Wolfville in, in June called Light in the Forest, and it was about uh, uh, the, uh, that the, around mental health and that there's always light at the end of a dark forest. And, and I'm just wondering if you could kind of uh, you use this uh, opportunity to uh, uh, talk to forestry industry workers to give them a sense of how hard you're working on this and how uh, Nova Scotians are pulling behind them to help them get through this dark place in the forest to the light. Because I think that's an important, uh, you know, you're working hard I'm sure hours and hours meetings and putting forward ideas uh, and working through all this, but the pieces of information are going to 
you know, come out in bits and pieces. So just to, to relay to forestry workers and the communities and families around them uh, about all the work that's going on. Ms. Dean. So, you know, I, I guess I would say that no matter how hard we're working, um, we have, um, you know, a genuine concern and a deep appreciation for how difficult it is for these families, the workers, the people in the sector. You know, and I think each and every one of us are committed to trying to make a difference um, to help and, and to move things forward and to put the supports in place, you know, to, to help people get through this difficult time. Um, you know, we've heard a lot of stories from people, from individuals. We've all spoken to them. And, um, you know, we recognize that this is a period of intense uncertainty for people and that that creates a lot of stress in their lives. So, you know, I guess I would say, yes, we're working hard, but that in no way makes up for, you know, the the stress that people are feeling right now, and we appreciate that and we understand that. So we hope that the supports that we've put in place are making a difference and can help them get through. And I think, you know, the emotional support line that was um, set up, we have had some feedback that that is being utilized and is quite helpful for people. Because they, they are, I, th I think, you know, experiencing enormous stress as they think about what the future looks like and how they're going to move forward. So, you know, I think we hope that we're able to make a difference and to provide some assurance that there's a path forward. Um, but we know that, that it is very, very difficult for people, um, for the workers and for the families. Ava, did you want to comment on some of your work there? Ms. Zappalay? Thank you. I, I did want to comment on that particular point because um, the 1888 number that we set up on December 23rd, it, it comes into Labour and Advanced Education. It's the, uh, the Labour Standards phone number, but the, the people that answer that phone are trained to handle difficult situations uh, and they, they have the personality and the expertise and the, the history of, of um, taking difficult phone calls. So that's why we chose that, that toll free number. So when people call, it's not just a quick call asking what resource is available or where can I go. They, they want to take some time to talk about their own personal situation. So we're getting a, a good sense um, from the folks that answer that phone how people are feeling throughout Nova Scotia. And um, one of the, the best resources that we have at our fingertips are the Nova Scotia Works Offices because they're in communities. People don't have to travel very far to get to a Nova Scotia Works Office and sit down with a person and have a conversation. And so I was just at the Nova Scotia Works Office in New Glasgow on January 31st. And they have... a it looked like about 10 or 11 employees, quite a number of employees. It's a very welcoming uh, center in the middle of town. And um, they were talking about people who were coming in who had just been laid off, feeling quite angry and stressed by their situation, but leaving with a resume in hand, with a plan in place about what sort of certificates they need to update, knowing that they can access that free up training. And, and focused on other opportunities. And while I was there, there was also an employer from the local community in meeting with um, uh, meet people to talk about the work that his company had available and, and the employees that he needed. So I feel like um, uh, once people can take a little bit of control themselves and, and uh, control their destiny in a certain way, um, it does help the situation on a personal level. Thank you. We'll move for Oh, Ms. Dean. Thank you. I, I did want to add something um, that um, in terms of um, how MLAs could help, it would be also to encourage individuals and businesses to register with the Nova Scotia Works offices because if they do that, then we can start to make the connections between businesses who are looking for people and the empl potential employees who are looking for work because there is some matchmaking that can happen there. So that would be uh, an important point of referral if, if people could do that. So I'll just add Thank that. You. Thank you. And we'll turn over to the PC caucus. Mr. Rushton, for your first question. 
Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for being here this morning. I appreciate uh, the, the hard venture that you guys have been up against for the last few weeks and, and uh, the next few months to come. And uh, I, I appreciate the recognition that you've stated that industry have been resilient in this whole matter and, and looking to the future. And I've certainly heard from many of the people that are reaching out to you as critic for the PC caucus. I've certainly heard from many that are reaching out to you and, and probably a few more that haven't, haven't been in contact yet. Uh, and we're certainly hearing the, uh, the impacts on life um, already with uh, machines lost and, and uh, un unknowing where, where the next paycheck's gonna come from. And some, something I've certainly heard from, from province-wide in the sector is, is an idea that was, that was thrown to you. I know it was thrown to government. It was thrown, thrown to the transition team. And, uh, and we actually, on January 23rd, we, we wrote the Minister of Energy and Mines and, and the Minister of Lands and Forest, and I'm sure, uh, Ms. Towers, you're aware of it. But it, it was basically asking, asking uh, for an understanding of the impact of, the, of a must-run situation for, for Brooklyn Energy and, uh, and Port Hawkesbury. And uh, we're not asking for full harvest trees to be going into biomass. What we're looking for is, and we're hearing from the sector, that they are making plans for the future, 18 months down the road. For a short term, they need a place to put their market product to help them get over that hurdle. Um, so we're talking about residue from mills. We're not talking cutting trees down for, for bioproduct. Um, no one is interested in seeing Nova Scotia power rates go up. That, that's, that's a known fact in Nova Scotia. But before it ever even came from the transition team and before many got to the transition committee, the Premier stated on January 29th, I'll, I'll table those letters, but he did state on January 29th that must run was not going to happen. Um, so I, I guess I, I'm, I'm curious from the transition point of view, is uh, wh where did the basis of that analysis come from? And uh, if you have that, could you table that, please? Ms. Dean? <clears throat> Thank you for that. So, um, so I know what you're speaking about is the need to find a, a home for the wood chips, which is primary residue, yeah, in the short term. So, um, in terms of, of must run status, um, so that, so well, I'll just back up. Um, Increasing the capacity of the biomass plants to take more chips obviously is a private sector decision. So, um, you know, must run status was removed and as, as part of the electricity policy. And, um, you know, the Premier did say that that wouldn't be reinstated. I think the other thing to remember in terms of imposing conditions on business that could be seen to be subsidizing the uh, private sector or the sawmill operators is the fact that, again, it puts our exclusion at risk and could create trade risk for us. So, you know, interfering in market pricing or interfering in in that area uh, is creates trade risk for us. Um, what I will say, though, is private sector-led opportunities to use more chips um, would be welcomed in the sector, and I, I do believe that uh, Nova Scotia Power has looked at the opportunity to use more chips in the Point Tupper plant. So again, those uh, contracts and those negotiations can happen between the business operators and Nova Scotia Power. And if that results in utilizing more of the chips in the short to medium term, that would provide um, a good solution for some of the sawmill operators, definitely. Mr. Rushton, for your supplementary. Thank you, and I, I appreciate that. And, and I guess the sector, and, and myself too, not being an expert in, in that whole aspect, don't really understand if we're already using that product to produce some power. They're asking for a short term of EMRA, Nova Scotia Power, to purchase more chips, produce maybe 80% is even a talk from the sector rather than a must run situation. Um, the Premier stated that the bills of Nova Scotia Power would increase. Has there been an analysis to determine exactly how much those bills would increase or would they increase at all? Ms. Dean. So I think you'd have to ask Nova Scotia Power about rates and how it purchases fuel and uh, what that means in terms of rates. But you know, they uh, there is legis there are regulations that ensure ratepayer stability, and that is um, you know how Nova Scotia Power operates. So if you have a specific question about that, I would go directly to Nova Scotia Power. 
What I will say again, though, is that the opportunity to increase uh, the usage of biomass at the Point Tupper plant would be welcomed by industry, I would imagine, and that uh, that could be an option for some operators. I will turn it over to the NDP caucus. Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Um, as we discuss the, the sector and we also discuss, you know, the future of, of forestry and, and follow through with the Leahy report, um, I don't want to and I don't think any of us should fall into uh, feeling like there's a dichotomy of, you know, sustainability and, and ecological forestry and economic viability. In fact, that was very much the point that Leahy, um, Professor Leahy made right in the, the introduction to his report, that in fact the long-term financial viability of the forestry sector depends entirely on the sustainability and, and the continued um, vibrance of, uh, of our forests. Um, and so related to that, you, you know, there are some high value relatively low volume forestry industry activities, businesses that um, operating now and that have been operating where the primary constraint has actually been lack of access to hardwood. Um, and I'm thinking, for example, of Group Savoy, which is right in Picto, employs, you know, approximately 50 people and their challenge has been, you know, that they're a small player in, in a province where the, the dominant industry has not been oriented to, to, their, to their business. Um, and, and even though on Crown land we should be seeing, you know, 15 to 20 percent hardwoods, they're, they're not getting 15 to 20 percent of, of, of hardwood um, when Crown land is cut. So, um, so again, I, I kind of am, am going back a bit to that question of access to, to Crown land and, and who's going to be managing Crown land, given that there are businesses um, that, you know, could be, could be ramping up, could be, could be employing more people for more weeks of the year, could be, um, could be innovating without having to develop entirely new markets. They've, they've got markets. Their constraint is, is access to the wood. Um, and, and, you know, happy coincidence, uh, the kind of forestry that they, um, that leads to them having access to the kind of wood that they need is actually in line, as I understand it, you know, with the, with the kind of, with ecological forestry. So, um, you know, is there, is there a path to uh, implementation of Leahy that uh, prioritizes uh, crown land management access for, for those sorts of employers and, and industrial activities that require um, robust mixed use forestry and, and particularly for, for Savoy. So Ms. Towers, are you best, you're best to answer that? Okay, Ms. Towers. And there's, uh, I can speak to groups of us specifically, but more generally about hardwood as well. Um, and remember I said earlier, one of the aspects behind ecological forestry is just that, the range of species and types and sizes out there in the forest because it allows you flexibility. <laughs> Um, so one of the things we've been doing, and you all have a role in this as acts and regulations, et cetera, evolve, is the, the province, remember, inherited agreements that were done back in the 1950s and 60s. So we've been moving away from that. So, um, for example, when we signed the agreement with Port Hawkesbury Paper in 2012, we built into it the ability to direct wood to hardwood sawmills, okay? So when we did the Great Northern Timber license, we built into that that hardwood would specifically go to Group Savoie to support them. So we're doing that as part of that. So, so absolutely, we interact. Um, our executive director probably talks to Group Savoie every week. So we're always trying to help with that flow. But more broadly, um, what we're doing, and when I spoke about the innovation and some of the products we're looking forward um, and the technologies that are coming out, particularly when you get into things like biofuels or whatever, the beauty of them is that they're species agnostic. They don't, like our uh, industry evolved over decades around spruce fir primarily. What we can do with newer things is we can use just about any species. Hardwood in particular works really well when you start getting into biofuels. 
Um, so we have an opportunity now to be more effective in using um, the beauty of the diversity in Nova Scotia for forests is that we do have so many tree species. But the industries evolved around a focus on spruce and fir. But because we're broadening that out through innovation, that will enable a better mix of flow. Okay. Okay, Ms. Roberts for a supplementary. Thank you. Um, and, and again, I mean, I guess my concern would be that we would somehow end up doubling down on the high volume, uh, low value forestry management orientation because we're in a moment of crisis. And, and I think even, you know, Savoie, uh, they also need a market for their chips. Like every, everybody, everybody's looking for, for that market for the chips, but orienting our, you know, our forestry industry around the, the high volume, low value um, <coughs> is, 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 is not sustainable, number one. And, um, and it's, it doesn't have the same economic uh, spin-off potential as, as some of those higher, um, higher value, um, you know, processed products. Um, one of the things that came out of the, the closure of Bowater was the establishment of a first um, community forest, uh, you know, which was, I, I don't need to tell, I certainly don't need to tell Ms. Towers, you know, aimed to, to balance those various forest values. And, and I know that there was a conversation uh, in the Leahy report about how the Medway community forest is, is challenged by its, its small, um, the small size or the inadequate size maybe of, uh, the, of its crown land license. And there was also a conversation, uh, you know, when that initial, the initial work on Crown, uh, on community forests was done, about a second and a third community forest, one of which was in Pictou County. And I'm wondering if there is any uh, option for exploring that as, you know, Northern Pulp's licenses are, are maybe uh, in some flux. Ms. Towers? Okay, so there, I would say, and it, this speaks to some of the questions you, you've all had, um, and, and maybe for better or worse, by being involved for so long, I've seen the evolution of the forest sector in this province, environmentally, ecologically, socially, uh, as well as economically. Um, and so things have changed from, you know, 1960s acts that uh, pretty much tied a lot of the resource and who made decisions um, to evolving over time so that we are doing the community force with Medway and I was directly involved when those evolved um, and also uh, one of the other aspects I'm very proud of and is the Mi'kmaq forestry initiative that we've worked on and we're also looking at um, how to develop that and we've been cooperating as well. We haven't spoken much about our, our federal government partners who have also been at the table trying to help um, Because they are putting more money into the uh, through the indigenous forestry initiative, which is a national fund um, So that we're doing a lot of work on those sites um, the community forest itself is currently 10,000 hectares um, And they've uh, been looking for more land to make it economically viable but at the same time, they're also in, those of you that deal with the Southwest in particular know, the Western end of the province it, um, has a lot of difficulty right now because it's a, a big part of what makes things economically viable is the transportation costs. It's typically energy, labor, and transportation. Um, and so the community force is part of that where some of their markets, they were handling the firewood market to supply Kedji, it was a very valuable uh, contract for them. Someone else has that contract now, apparently. Um, so for them to truck, so they're still operating. So right now we're working with them and we've given them bridge funding to continue um, while they're sorting out some of the things they can do and evolve for their markets. Um, but right now, they're, they're not cutting very much at all, even on the 10,000 hectares. So we're certainly in discussions with them, um, but now is not necessarily time to rush to add more land until they figure out their own plans for what they want to do. But we're absolutely still having those conversations, just as we are with the Mi'kmaq. Okay? okay thank you. Um, we'll turn it over to the Liberal Caucus, Ms. De Costanzo. <coughs> thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you very much. It really has been a very enlightening for me because I, you know, my my riding um, 
is very uh, urban and I don't really have too many people that come to me with these issues. So this has been a, an incredible learning thing for me. But as I'm sitting listening to you and, and hearing about the evolution, I mean, we, we cannot be the only province that's having this problem. And, it, it, you know, environment has become very important and other countries are looking at it as well. So I'm, I'm wondering what examples you can give us as how other countries or other provinces have looked after this same issue. Uh, you know, they must have had similar problems and how they, um, you know, two or three years later, um, what have they done and what, what is this committee or, or this team is learning from what they've done. If you can give us some examples and where we're heading, I'm sure there's some other examples you can share with us as well. Um, Ms. Towers? So I'll start and the others can add as they wish. Um, the, um, so I sit as a deputy on uh, the deputies committee of the Canadian Council Force Ministers. So that's our network, um, and then there's, there's groups that support that um, of staff as well. So we, we're very much tapped into what's happening in Canada. But also, as I mentioned at the start, it's a global industry. Yeah. So we're very aware of that. I'd say um, we're seeing a couple of things. One, the innovation side is common across the world. Um, and, to, and that's tied into not only having more opportunities in products and processes, but very much it's tied into the low carbon bioeconomy that's evolving. Because a lot of these options we're looking at, as I said, it's about replacing petroleum products. So you're seeing that grow very much. One piece of that, which we touched on, was around wood heat. Um, so, because we know as you switch from heating, for example, with oil or other petroleum products to using a wood, um, which, you know, humans are sort of circling back to it, um, but there's a lot of analysis on it. And the most effective ways of doing that, um, you can use wood to create electricity, but it's much more efficient to use it for heating. So not only the, the uh, request for proposals that we just put out for some of our provincial buildings, and we'll be doing more, um, but you're seeing that evolve not only in Canada but around the world because what's the most efficient is when you create clusters. So it's district heating. So you can have um, uh, basically you know, one source that can be powering an entire residential development or a company, uh, a hospital, you name it. Um, there's some all across Canada, Quebec, BC, you name it. As far as immediate issues such as with upheaval with changes in mills, for example, BC would be the, um, I'm sure most of you are aware, is going through a lot of upheaval. And that, that's reflective of a couple things. They're certainly stuff, suffering from trade tariffs. Um, they had a major mountain pine beetle uh, infestation that killed a lot of trees and they rushed to salvage them as quickly as they could, but they couldn't. So now they have a wood supply issue. They can't supply all their mills, which is not the same issue here. But they're going through uh, transition programs as well, which, um, and uh, one of the ones, ironically, is exactly what Ava and Don Bureau and others developed for the skills training. They were doing the same thing for accelerated training. So we, so we are seeing those same patterns. Um, we're very open to seeing what others are doing and what works well. But we're, the innovation and the district heating, I'd say, are two of the biggest opportunities that we want to build upon. Okay. DJs. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? No? Okay. Ms. D. Costanzo for a supplementary. Thank you very much. And actually, my second question was about apprenticeship and what there is, but you covered a lot of it. But one thing, if, um, if I may ask, is uh, the people that you're dealing with, what age group? I know that, for example, farming, we're having an issue that, you know, we don't have people who are going into farming, uh, and, and we have more older generation who have been in the farming. Is the... Um, forestry industry in the same boat, or is it younger people who have gone into it and now without? Who, who are the people looking for the jobs? If you can just give us some age groups and what do you see there? Ms. Zappale? So uh, the folks coming forward to ask about training and retraining, I would say the average age is around 40 to 45-ish, but, but as young as 19, someone very new into the profession feeling like maybe maybe I need to kind of get additional skills or additional certificates to to make myself more um, attractive as a as an employee um, right through to older older folks so 
but but usually mid career. Yeah. Okay. We will go into our final round. We'll do one question each because we are coming short of time. So um, we'll do one more round with one question for each caucus. And we will hand it over to the PC caucus, Mr. Rushton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a quick question. My first day being on the committee, is there time for a committee business after the questioning period, or does it end That's right That's when we have our committee business. Okay, thank you. The... I will uh, speak then, then. Okay. Uh, so just, my, I guess my final question is uh, is, is a bit on, on vision that I hear from, from the sector. And uh, as you can appreciate, there's thousands of families that are affected right now with what's going on. Um, I, I, I hear some people say that provincially they're not affected by this. Well, there's going to be a big economic impact of, of, of the changing diversity, um, whether it's short term or long term, uh, one could debate one side or the other. Um, at the end of the day, government has to be there for the people when they need it. And, and setting up the transition team is a step. Uh, we, we could argue that maybe it was a little bit too late, that things could have been done sooner than later. Um, but one of the main questions that I'm getting from the sector is what does the vision look like for us in, in, in the time to come? And in and around that question, with the vision of what forestry is within Nova Scotia, I, I, I draw myself to the, uh, the, the terms of reference for this committee. And with an, uh, with an issue that's so important that's affecting thousands of people, uh, many, many jobs, um, yes, I, I, I think we're going to save some of the jobs, but there's still going to be many people. I, I appreciate the fact that you're talking about retraining and, uh, and things, but the fact of the matter is in the forestry sector, there's a lot of people that, that are aged. Um, to be very honest, and for, for them to go back to a school environment or re retrain, I, I, I think we could re rethink some of those visions of what we could do with some of those uh, senior senior people within the forest sector. But I, I draw back to the, the, the terms of reference for, for this committee, and when, when I'm reading through it, I, I, I'm shocked at how important this issue is. And the mandate sets out that it's a six-month committee for, for the people to be sitting on that, and at most, for the first four weeks, you only need four weeks of meetings on a weekly basis, and then it's up to you, uh, Madam Chair of the committee, to decide on what those those meetings are going to look like in the time. So I guess in, in combined my, my two questions, what, what, what does the vision look like, and do you think that you can actually come together within only four weeks of weekly meetings and then go whatever is decided there, there later? I guess I'm looking for what the vision of forestry is and what the vision of this team is going to look like on a weekly basis, monthly basis, and far beyond what the six-month mandate is for this committee. Okay. Ms. Uh, Dean. Thank you. Um, so I'll start with uh, the, the part about the committee, and then I'll turn to my colleague around uh, the vision for forestry. So um, appreciating that... Uh, the, the accelerated timeline for meetings uh, over the next month, actually we've had those meetings, we've had five meetings weekly uh, since the committee was formed. So, uh, you know, six months is a, is a timeline that was originally, that was initially established, but uh, we will see how that evolves. And I think we are committed to meeting as frequently as we need to, to develop the path forward and to work with our colleagues. So uh, whether that's weekly uh, or bi-weekly, we'll do what it takes or more we will do what it takes. But in the terms of reference, we initially estimated that it would be weekly for now. Um, and we gave ourselves six months in order to determine where we're at. And then we'll reevaluate re at six months to see whether we need to continue, whether we need to move in a different direction, uh, and at what stage we're at. Um, with respect to, to vision, uh, I will say that um, I'm going to hand it over to Julie to talk about the vision, but I think it's important to keep in mind that the work we're doing and the path that we're on is one of partnership with the industry, and we are co-creating. So again, I'm, I'll turn it over to Julie, though, to speak about currently where we are with respect to the vision for forestry. Our guideline is to have a sustainable, ecologically sustainable forestry sector that can compete globally. So, you know, that is our overarching goal. And there will be different ways that we achieve that. And we have to work hand in hand with the forestry sector. That's why Julie's here on the, on the transition team. So, Julie, over to you on the work that your department's been doing around that. Ms. Towers. Okay. 
Because this comes to the, that same thing, that it's about the forests in Nova Scotia and making sure we have the diversity and we have the choices so that um, it doesn't matter what perspective people come from, very strong environmental, very strong business. Um, it's about having the opportunity to do whatever it is, you know, whether it's ecotourism, whether it's lumber, we should have the opportunity to do all those things. Um, and when we speak, and we have been to a lot of folks, um, and they're talking about, you know, vision, and often um, no one actually disagrees on that big, broad vision that you just um, mentioned. But what they're talking about often is the specific outcomes. They want to know, you know, how many mills, you know, how much land's going to be managed this way, et cetera. And I always try to encourage them to think, is, <coughs> This is such a long term, um, whether you, when you're talking about forests and it's uh, folks in our department do it regularly, we think in hundred year cycles. Um, so we're, we're absolutely trying to help people in the immediate, um, but you've got to leave yourself room um, in terms of what can happen. We could have the same number of mills, more mills, less mills, but I can tell you this, we're only going to be um, having forest products, whatever they might be, whether it's lumber or mushrooms or anything else. You want to leave yourself room to have all those choices emerge because businesses generally are a lot better developing their businesses than I would ever be. Um, and so my job is to make sure the resource is there and it's healthy so the choices are there. Um, and so we're absolutely still continuing with a lot of those aspects, and you referred to it, that's what Professor Leahy was getting at, is you balance all those things to make it easy to have those choices in the long run. Um, our key is to help people as best we can, and one of the differences is that the transition team is focused very much in a shorter term around the, uh, uh, the impacts around northern pulp not operating as a pulp mill in the immediate future to make sure the supply chain is in intact. And this is the exact same thing we went through with Bullwater and New Page. It was to keep the critical mass of a supply chain, the woodlot owners, the contractors, the mills. And that's exactly where we've been focused. Um, because what the, if the supply chain's there, it can evolve to whatever it needs to be. And that's what we're working on. And we'll turn it over to the NDP caucus, Ms. Chender. Uh, thank you. Um, and I think this is a, maybe a bit of a segue from that. But um, I mean, we know that the closure of the Northern Pulp Mill has, has impacted many individuals, many families, um, and that it's a difficult time in the province. And I know that you guys on the team are preoccupied with that. Uh, but as I alluded to previously, we also know that as unwelcome as it is, uh, you know, we're in a moment that provides some opportunity. And so, you know, we talked about one of those opportunities in terms of engaging communities about the future that they'd like to see. Um, you mentioned workforce issues and capital projects coming down the pipe that are going to need employees, uh, need workers. Um, but the other is that, you know, we spent the last legislative session talking about a climate emergency, but, but we ha don't hear anything about what the labor needs for this green transition that we're in, like it or not, if we want to survive, is going to look like. Um, and so we talk a lot about a just transition. Um, and you know, this gets to business, so Minister of Business is here. Maybe he wants to answer these questions. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, how is the transition team or the government generally? I mean, this is just a question that we're asking everywhere. Like, how are we thinking about the principles of a just transition and the transition to a greener economy as it relates to this or anything else? So, so one is you just answered, I think, is looking at the kind of ecological viability of the forest. Um, but, you know, obviously that spreads much more broadly. Um, and, you know, are there other ways in which we're discussing this? And I know one of the criticisms of this question has been, you know, if we're looking at sort of low paid, low ish paid workers, that's not going to translate for employees of the mill, maybe, who were, you know, at a very high wage grade, who are maybe older. But, the reality is, is a green economy is going to have all the same pay scales 
as our current economy. We still need management. We still need all of those things. And so is this something, and maybe this is for Ms. Appale, I'm not sure, that, that you're really grappling with here? Because the reality is not all of these people, as my colleagues have pointed out, are going to immediately you know, find new jobs in the forestry sector. So how are you taking into account this idea of the climate emergency and, and, a, and a green just transition as you discuss um, as you discuss the issues that we've been talking about today. Who wants to start? Okay, Ms. Dean, you can start, and we'll see who takes it from <laughs> we'll there. See where we go from okay. there. Um, so thank you. Uh, and, and it's interesting when you talk about jobs in the green economy. Um, again, um, there's opportunities for people with skills, you know, to adapt those skills or upgrade or change them and redirect. So um, whether those be for jobs that are um, in programming, actually, that's in energy and mines, or whether they would be uh, training for some of the treatments and civil culture treatments that, that you provide training programs for, or whether they be with other associations through Ava's work, right? So um, I think the opportunity that we have is to keep people here in Nova Scotia and make sure that we give them um, a ch the chance to stay. And if that means retraining that can be aligned uh, with some of the things that you've mentioned, that's uh, a good area of focus for us. So probably not answering it completely, but you know there is a view to how you take people who have a certain skill set from this sector and help them adapt into jobs that are, you know, green jobs, I guess. And some of the jobs they do are green jobs already. Um, but I think very much we would be looking at how we can help them and work with them to make that kind of a transition. So. Ava, I don't know if I've been clear Ms. Um, so it's an interesting question and, and a, a variety of ways to help um, people coming for workers. And and I th that's why we're taking a customized approach, worker by worker. Some people feel a real passion for the forestry sector. They've worked in the forestry sector. Their families have for generations. Um, and they want to continue working in their in that sector, and others others are saying, uh, I want some. I want to try something else. And and um, uh, we we have. A, I've been in here before talking about sandboxes. So we have ten sandboxes where students are encouraged to be entrepreneurial in their thinking. And one of them is at the agriculture campus in Truro. Um, cultivate the ATE is an eight, and and those are students uh, working. Uh, being innovative within the agriculture sector. And I think that if we can encourage young people to be entrepreneurial and, and think entrepreneurially within our post-secondary sector, then we'll, we'll get towards the vision that you were just outlining. And um, the Nova Scotia Community College also is very responsive to the needs of industry, and the needs of the sector, and will continue to offer innovative programs to students as, as, as industry demands that. Okay, right, Ms. Towers. And I would just add a bit that um, uh, absolutely one of the things that we're observing uh, across Canada is that um, two things. One, people who currently work in the sector want to work in the sector. They're very tightly tied. Uh, they prefer to be outdoors instead of a committee room. Um, they love what they do. They want to be there. Um, and that has, in many cases, it's because it evolved in their families and that's what they did. But what we are seeing is the labor shortage that's emerging across Canada from people who operate machines, uh, getting people who can plant trees. There's this mindset that forestry is a low-skilled, um, low-tech area. Whereas the, um, what it actually is, is particularly the innovation we're, we're doing in the, what we call it is the low carbon bioeconomy. That is the focus. Whether we're talking about something relatively simple coming back, like wood heat, it's a lower carbon. But it's also things like the operator training we do for if you're doing partial harvesting, like some of the treatments in the Leahy report, that's what we train for. It's to help people understand how they're working in there. Um, we have of, uh, uh, positions and we're working across energy and environment in our department, for example, on um, 
really understanding carbon cycle and tracking it because that's the biggest issue and often the biggest bone of contention, right? Is how do you measure that? So we have a specialist and we work with the Canadian uh, um, academics that are the best at measuring uh, carbon emissions. Okay. Thank you. And we'll uh, hear from the Liberal Caucus, Mr. McClellan. One question, and we're getting short of thank time. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I do want to thank, uh, again, the, the, the Deputy Ministers for being here. Um, I think it was Claudia pointed out, and, and I think it's it's fair to repeat, um, you're not political players, you're, you're public servants. And I think that, again, we're, we're in a world where, unfortunately, that's the reality. Uh, and if, if the workers in the sector uh, see this as a political uh, fight, uh, then we've done a disservice to the sector. And um, that's not an accusation. Um, that's just a fact. So I think that uh, when we can have uh, avenues and venues like this to be able to share the, this information objectively, transparently, uh, I think that's uh, that speaks volumes to the, you know, the, the transition team itself. And again, this isn't about uh, one party or the other. It's about um, a, a public service and a sector uh, that uh, really need to work with each other to make sure that we get to the best possible place. And I think that um, obviously this is not again politically driven it's industry driven by and large and uh, not um, you know discrediting the, the 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 role of the transition team and who's on that team but uh, I do think that you know with industry being there uh, the community aspect is, is of critical importance as well, and I think that uh, you see what uh, Elizabeth Smith McCross and Tory are doing uh, with with the Cumberland County group that they have sort of public meetings. And I'm not in the room, so I don't know the tone, but it seems to be based on the the media sort of um, uh, reports that uh, it's objective. They're obviously uh, impacted by this, and they're looking for ways to get through. So. Um, that input, that that uh, feedback, and, and this was touched on earlier, but it, it really is critical. So sort of formally, from a formal perspective, if someone has an idea, so obviously the regions are impacted differently. The conversations that these members are having with their sector players are different than I'm having at home. Um, there's there's options and ideas that come forward from, from that meeting that Tori and Elizabeth had. Um, an idea about truck registration, and, and you can give a waiver of a fee, uh, as I think uh, Tim had brought forward. Um, innovation options, so if there's some kind of uh, group out there that wants to be innovative. What's the formal mechanism whereby they come to you? And I'm not talking, I know websites and emails, but I mean, do they have the opportunity to participate, to present? Because again, if we want to keep this in the, in the realm or what we be, believe it is, which is objectively trying to get to the best possible finish line, how do we make sure that those particular groups in all the, all the regions across the province uh, are being heard and their ideas have, a, has, have an official place to kind of be um, unpacked? Ms. Dean. Um, Thank and you, you could just add your closing remarks to the oh, end of this. Okay. And it says two minutes or less for closing remarks. <laughs> I'm happy to do that. <laughs> um, thank you. You know, you're right. There is a formal mechanism. Anybody can email a member of the transition team. You know, there's there's a couple of ways. And again, through the transition team members, they're gathering feedback. If an individual or if community groups want to share with those individuals, they will bring it forward. They can write directly to me. They can email me. I've received a lot of information directly that we're bringing forward. We get business proposals from companies that are interested in, you know, investing in the province. And then we work with our colleagues at Nova Scotia Business Inc. So, um, you know, there's many ways people can feed that information in, and we are, we're happy to receive it and happy to, to move forward and act on it. And, uh, and, we, and we share it. So did you want to add something, Julie? No. Really don't have time. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so you may give your brief closing remarks. So I will give my closing, closing remarks. remarks, which are very brief. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, so again, thank you all very much. We, we do appreciate the opportunity to be here to update people, and we recognize that um, it's important for people to understand how to access information, to understand you know, that we're here trying to support them to the best of our ability. So we appreciate all of your questions today. And you know, others have said it, and, and I will say it too, I feel uh, very privileged to be part of this work. It's important work, and it's work that touches the lives of thousands of people throughout our province. Um, we've been impressed with the ideas that have been coming forward and what we've seen from the sector so far. And I think most of all, uh, these people and businesses have proven to be adaptable and resilient. And we draw on that energy to keep up our end of the bargain here to help in the best ways that we can and to continue to welcome feedback, listen to people, and uh, 
fulfill our mandate on the transition team. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for finding the time to come in. I know your, your team's out not... I know you meet on Tuesdays, but I hear that you're going to this mill, that mill, meeting here in this part of the province. So thank you for making time to fit in because um, uh, we're limited to our time to meet before the house sitting. So thank you for being so um, easy to book a meeting with and thank you for coming and the work that you're doing. Um, we'll excuse you. I'm sure you'll be um, targeted by the press uh, right now. So um, you can, <laughs> you're not off, you're not off duty. <laughs> <laughs> Target it, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, we will have a very short business meeting, remember, so please stay at the table. <laughs> focus, you'll be the focus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, if you uh, all re remember, you got a piece of correspondence from the clerk, it, I think yesterday it came in? Yes. Yes, so um, um, it's dated February 3rd from the, the clerk, so just any questions about that? Okay, Mr. Rushton, you had a question or a comment? Or? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, in, in light of what we heard today, and uh, and I, I know I still have a stack of questions. There's there's many other questions. Put in light what the Minister of Business uh, just elaborated on his last uh, last question. It, it's important work that's taking place here for Nova Scotians, and, and and it's a big impact. Maybe one of the biggest impact that many of us as MLAs will ever see. Um, I, I'd like to table a motion that we bring uh, bring the committee uh, team back again within a month's time and uh, and go over further questions and a review of what's uh, what's taking place. Um, the committee does meet during the legislative sitting, just so that you know. Madam Chair, it's, it, it's a dip, diplomatic uh, process. We're elected to represent the people of Nova Scotia. We don't meet in the ledge usually on a, on a morning. I, this is a morning meeting that we've had. Um, I, I understand what's usually gone in, in norms. Uh, committees have been changed over the last few years since I've been elected. Times have changed. Um, but I'd, I'd still like to table my motion. Okay. Any other feedback? Okay, there is a recorded vote. Um, we have uh, a motion on the table to call the Mr. McClellan. Okay, we'll have a brief recess. Um, perhaps somebody needs to make a mo um, ask for an extension of time. Ms. DiCostanzo. I would like to ask for an, an extra whatever it takes us, a few minutes for after 12 o'clock. I do have a meeting at 12.30. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. We're, are we in agreement to extend the, the meeting briefly? Yes. Agreed. Agreed? Okay. We will. I just record a motion. Everybody's names except we have to change.
Okay, um, order. We will resume the meeting. There has been an ask for a recorded vote, vote by Mr. Hugh, Mr. Um, Irving. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If I may, uh, we'd like to propose uh, an amendment. Uh, we agree with uh, all of our colleagues at the table that this is a very important issue, an issue that Nova Scotians are interested in. Uh, and uh, But we do feel uh, that we should give the committee a little bit more time to, to do its work and that it would be appropriate to wait until uh, after the House session and uh, that would probably be, be uh, you know, two or two and a half months or so, and that would give the committee sufficient time to uh, uh, do their work and have more actions to report on. Uh, Mr. Houston. Thank you, and uh, thank the, the member for his, uh, for his suggestion. I think, I think in, 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 in the case of the situation right now, two and a half months is a long time. Uh, that's, that's the first point that I want to make. The second point is, is when this, um, when the transition team was initially struck, there was, uh, you know, some undertakings from them that there would be updates provided to the public on a regular basis. Weekly updates, I think, was the initial commitment. Those, those haven't really been taking place. And um, the, the, we noticed yesterday there, there is a website, and I, I think we did, uh, we had written as a caucus to most members, about, uh, most ministers about this situation. And, and um, yesterday we did get a series of responses from the individual ministers were, were generally form letters, um, but uh, a lot of them directed us to a website. And we have been monitoring that website. And we noticed that just, just, um, just over the last two days, some of the language on that website has changed. Like um, it, it, used to, it used to read forestry sector support and transition, but that was yesterday. But today it just reads forestry sector transition. Uh, and one thing that is totally relevant to this discussion is, is up until yesterday, the website used to say that updates will be shared as decisions are made. Uh, today, that is no longer on the website. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that this is, this is a matter of, of great interest to Nova Scotians, particularly those thousands of families that are directly, directly impacted by this. And they just want to know uh, what's happening, what the transition team is coming up with. And, and it's really silence. Uh, what we've seen is some rushed announcements that weren't particularly clear and had to be clarified later. A lot of reactionary uh, communications from the committee, which I don't think are, are particularly helpful. So uh, I guess in the absence of, of the transition team itself updating Nova Scotians and keeping Nova Scotians informed, in the absence of that, and we have seen an absence of that, and I believe that going forward it's, it's, there's a very strong possibility that we'll see even less and less Particularly, the, the the changes to the website suggest that. So, it, it's, uh, so in the absence of, of communications out to Nova Scotians, I think it's incumbent upon us as legislators to to keep our, our finger on the pulse. And I, I don't think I don't think uh, waiting a couple months uh, because it's um, uh, maybe more convenient for members who might be busy when, with legislature. Uh, I think this is important. I think I think that this uh, transition committee should be communicating with Nova Scotians, and I think they should be, uh, and they, they seem like they'd be willing to come back before this committee. So I would uh, I would uh, I'm not in favor of the of the amendments. Uh, I would stick to the uh, initial motion, which is that 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 the transition team uh, come back before this committee. It doesn't matter if the House is sitting or not. Come back before this committee. Uh, in this chamber, uh, certainly within 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 four weeks, I think within a month was the, was the was the suggestion. That that's plenty of time, and I, I'd stick with that motion. So I would I'm not in favor of the amendment to push things out further, uh, and uh, we can we can deal with that as as we deal with that in the voting. But but my point is is that uh, I think that it's really important that the transition team be communicating with Nova Scotians, and I think we have the opportunity to make sure that happens, and that's what our focus is. Thank you. Okay, and then Mr. McClellan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, certainly. Okay, good. 
Um, Mr. McClellan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, certainly, um, I would agree with the member opposite that it is a, a, an important issue, a critical one. Uh, for many people in Nova Scotia, um, the, the information uh, sharing is is uh, vital. Uh, so I agree with those two points you made, and, and that's about it. Um, I think that um, you know talking, we're, we're here talking to to the committee who have uh, important work in terms of the transition team, the information that they're sharing, the the, the uh, steps they're taking, and the and the the work that's being done in terms of programs, for work for support, uh, support for workers, support for the sector, um, and and the way that the transition funds are going to um, allow or, or hopefully allow to uh, keep uh, workers whole to the extent that we can uh, to find new markets and those things. So I think that, you know, the, the work is carrying on. Uh, I disagree that the communication has been been terrible. Uh, I, I also disagree with the members' positioning around, I mean, we're, we're here talking today about uh, who knew what and uh, who sent emails to who and, and who was the first transition team which didn't exist, uh, as opposed to what the, what the actual work is being taken, undertaken by the transition team to get to a point where these workers are in a better place than they are today. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that this is the only mechanism. Uh, this, this committee is important, but it's certainly not the only mechanism for communication. Uh, I think there's a lot more to it than that. But again, we're, we're back into the political bantering about what this transition team is doing. Uh, they, Whether or not we, we meet during the legislative session isn't an indication of our concern. Uh, it's the fact that this is one committee, you have an agenda set, you have work to do. If the Conservatives want uh, this to be bumped up and have it directly after the session, uh, then obviously uh, we're willing to support that. Um, and I don't know what the agenda setting process is, but uh, if if there's a way that we can help get that on the on the list after the session, uh, then certainly we're willing to do that. But um, I do support the amendment uh, that we would we would do as the original uh, idea from Tory was that the the um, transition team would come back. Uh, but I don't support the idea that it has to happen during the session. So um, I'm I'm okay with voting on the amendment that we would do it after the legislative session. Okay, so we need to vote first oh. on the amendment. On the amendment, okay. And I have about okay, Mr. Houston. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And I think I think what uh, I'll maybe connect a few dots here for the uh, for the members. Uh, what we're talking about is accountability, and what we're talking about is transparency. And I think I think it's very uh, significant, and it should not be lost on these members because it's not lost on the families that are impacted. That a year ago, um, this government, uh, by way of the premier, said that this was being looked at. And what we heard today was that wasn't the case. Let's not let that happen again. Let's, let's, let's make sure that as, as legislators, we are keeping our finger on the pulse as to what this, what this committee is up to. This is, this, is, this, is, this is a responsibility of government. We owe it to those families that are impacted to be keeping a, a finger on the pulse. And I think more than a, more than a, a quarterly check-in at this sensitive time is, is is, is required. So um, I, I think the, the um, amendment um, is, um, is, 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 a, is a stall tactic that I don't think serves Nova Scotians in this case. So I just, just a question uh, procedurally, I mean, if, if we're going to, to what we do vote on the amendment and then vote on the initial, on the initial motion, and the and just uh, for, for the benefit the the um, the initial initial motion, both amendments call to bring the committee back. Um, the initial motion calls for them to, calls to bring them back in a in a timely fashion, and the amendment uh, wishes to defer that for longer. That's what we're talking about here. Is that is that my is my understanding correct? Do you have a comment? <clears throat> no, just that it would be great if we could vote. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we will um, vote on the amendment presented by Mr. Irving. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. The amendment is carried. We will vote on the original motion to uh, with the amendment. Um, all those in favor? Hold on. No, oh, recorded vote. Oh, recorded vote. Okay. So we will go to a recorded vote. Will you read the, uh, we read the motion as it stands now? I don't have it written down. Okay, Mr. Uh, Rushton. Well, it was amended by the... Okay, we don't have that in writing. So maybe a member can restate his amendment that they supported it. Uh, well, it's following up that we bring back the... Okay. 
Mr. Irving. Thank you. I believe your, your original motion said that we should bring back the transition committee to meet, uh, to meet this committee uh, as witnesses, and my amendment would say that the time frame for that would be at a meeting after the sitting of the legislature. Okay. So the, this, this, so, um, Pardon? Just so, just so, just so clear, the, the Mr. Houston. Thank you. The the uh, can you read the amended motion with the changes as it's as it's there? My the motion was that the the committee the uh, transition team would appear before the committee within the month. So I presume the liberal members have struck out the within the month and replace that with uh, within two and a half months. No, nearest post <clears throat> legislature sitting. Rising. The nearest date closest to the legislature rising. Post legislature rising. So it could be the the regular meeting we would have in April. We've already had our February meeting today and the next possible date would be in April most likely. Yeah. <laughs> so are we ready for the recorded vote? Um, with the amended motion. Um, I say my name. Ms. Lonis Croft, yes. <laughs> Ms. De Costanzo, yes. yes. Sorry. Mr. Irving, yes. Mr. McGuire, yes. Mr. McClellan, yes. Mr. Rushton, yes. Mr. Houston, yeah. Ms. Chender, yes. Ms. Roberts, yes. The motion is carried. We will now sit at the call of the clerk. <laughs> Who's running away? This meeting is adjourned.